I thought of it, but I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just following around. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> Thunderstorms, thunder storms, fickle hearted harbingers, a valley fever, <laughs> lustrous, provocative, voracious vandals. You flash over here, and way over there. <laughs> Why won't you strike? Right point. <laughs> we need big haboobs, he cried out to the internet like a frustrated marksman searching for a bullseye that has no storms. Except the ones John Serlin caught. <laughs> Which one do I trust? I don't want to bust. I'm 300 miles from home. <laughs> All right. So that's the last derivative poetry you're going to get out of me today. <laughs> this out. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what I want to talk to you about today, and at the end of the day where I need to work hard to keep everybody awake, because it's been going and there's a lot of great info out here, uh, but what I talked about, want to talk about is improving your odds. Now we've heard a lot about that. We've heard about luck. We've heard about practice and training and, and getting a plan together. Uh, and I want to talk about doing that with storm profiling, using focused persistence and pattern recognition to get out there and find the storms you want. So there's a lot of photographers in here. And, uh, and to get onto the things that we want, if we like the monsoon, if we like photography, or if we just like the storms, we want to see them, then there's, there's some things that uh, I want to talk about to, to help make that happen. So uh, I got my start. Um, I didn't start off in the 70s like Gary over here, um, but um, I did more of uh, opportunistic lightning photography starting in high school. 85 was my first lightning shot, but uh, then after that, um, about a dozen years ago, 12 years ago, I started looking to specifically get on storms and started in Arizona and uh, love our lightning, our structure. We get such a great variety of storms out here and the visibility is outstanding and such cool effects. So. That's Arizona, but I also, uh, like John and some of the others out here, I head out to the plains, started my, my first options out there in 2010 where uh, occasionally my kids will join me. They're, they're older kids, <laughs> but we go out and, and uh, check out some of the awesome storms that are out there, even the ones that look like they might belong on an alien planet or contain aliens. A little bit of feedback. <laughs> um, but getting there, you know, somebody mentioned earlier that what we wind up seeing from people is all their successes. We don't see all of the failures that happen in between. Um, so we, we don't post those as much, but it's good to talk about them because as mentioned, we learn a lot from those. Now, if you imagine uh, the, the times in your life where you have opportunities to get out and, and view or photograph the monsoon, um, you've also got to pair that up with a job, family, other commitments, all these things that you're doing. And you don't have a lot of chances to get out all the time and do that. So I kind of put all these little, these, uh, few little red dots up there. And if you look at those, maybe those would represent the few opportunities maybe you have in a particular time frame to go out and check some storm. <clears throat> but are you in the right spot to actually get what you want to see? Or are you going to have a bunch of failure modes and almost, almost got on the storm that you wanted, but not quite? So we talked next about, well, upping the amount of time that you're out there, getting that experience. The more times that you're out there, uh, the more opportunities you'll have to get on a storm that you want to see. But there's still failure modes that happen, especially if it's just kind of random how you're doing it. 
Now, there's also a lot of different types of storms. You know, profiling, what kind of storm do you want to see? Is it something that's a, that's a beautiful, uh, isolated lightning maker against the sunset? Or are you looking instead for something that might be a, a landspout maker or one of our rare supercell thunderstorms? Maybe a, a beautiful structured shelf cloud or an awesome haboob just rolling across the desert. All these different options. And if you're out there enough, you're going to get on them. But are you getting on the right ones? Well, the more you're out there, then uh, the more likely you are to get focused. You'll have that experience. You're going to build up what I'm going to talk about a lot more uh, is pattern recognition. This pattern recognition is where you see storms evolve. You see the forecast take shape and, and turn into an actual uh, event. And as you see that over and over again, you begin to see get experience in noticing what happens and how things develop. And that leads you to, to continuing to make uh, better choices. Now you're still going to have failures. It's never going to be 100% perfect, but those are learning opportunities too. So in getting opportunities to actually get out and learn and chase, who here got a chance to chase uh, every monsoon setup last year except John? <laughs> right? So, <laughs> he may not have even been able to do that. But uh, it's, it's tough to do. So we, we don't have all of the, all, you know, just 100% availability. And even if we could get out and chase every event, it's a big state. There's a lot happening. There's a lot of different things uh, that are taking place. So when we talk about getting experience and pattern recognition, is there another way we can up that level of experience that we get uh, if we don't have the, the huge amounts of time and gas money uh, to get out there and do every single opportunity? So it uh, got me thinking about some characters. Now, these guys all have something in common. Uh, they either have a special circumstance in their life from, from these, some of these movies where uh, they're either experiencing the same day over and over again, or they're able to reach out into the future and kind of see different ways things could play out depending on how they interact. And uh, the, uh, the end result, you know, maybe, maybe Bill Murray, he does have to eventually become a, maybe a better person. Um, our good buddy here, Nicolas Cage, I'm probably the only one that saw that movie. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, he could see a few minutes into the future and use that to save Los Angeles for <laughs> Doctor Strange, using the Time Stone uh, to look into millions of future options to save the universe. Well, we don't have superpowers. Uh, but we do have some really cool tools at our disposal that I want to catch up with you about. Now, this is interesting. Uh, this stream, screen's a little behind, so I to have that, uh, well, anyway, I'll try to read off what I've got over here, but, um, so the three things I'm going to talk to you about today are armchair archive chasing, and then convection allowing models, or what you sometimes hear as CAMs, and SKU team log P. You heard some of that brought up today. And we can make use of those, those tools to be able to uh, improve the experiences, the number of experiences we get with how storms are developing. So if we start off with archive armchair chasing, who, uh, who here that chases storms uh, has ever done an armchair chase? Yeah, I've got a few hands coming up here. So these, this, this, that's really cool. So that armchair chasing is when you don't have an opportunity to actually get out on the road and try to, to get on these storms, but you do have forecast tools that, at, uh, on the internet that you can check out. You have um, radar scope, if, or if you don't have it, Try to take a look at getting it. Um, there's also access to, to uh, satellite views and, and all this other information that you can use to look up while you are at home. Um, you know, maybe check out that forecast in the morning, and then as the day progresses, you tell yourself, you know, if I was chasing today, where would I invest my time and money in position myself? And then as the day plays out, see how things are happening. Are you on the storms that you would love to be on, uh, virtually speaking? And so that's armchair chasing. But uh, you only get one opportunity a day if there is a storm set up. So that's why I want to talk about getting into the archives to do it. So the SPC has a, a website, spc.noaa.gov. If you go there, um, there is, the, on their landing page, there's a storm reports link. When you click on storm reports, <coughs> you head to a page where you can scroll down and go to their severe thunderstorm events archive. And from there, Head on in and select a range of dates. Maybe go back a couple years, three or four years, select that monsoon time frame, uh, click retrieve events. And this can maybe, you know, there may be a better way to get in here, but this is a quick, easy way that I found. And, and uh, it'll create a list of events where maybe some severe reports have come in. And that's a good place to start. Click on any one of those links that come up 
and it's going to take you to a report page with a lot of data in it. Now, if you're doing a virtual chase and you pull this page up and you're trying to imagine well, what would I do on this day if I saw this information, um, you might get kind of led astray if you see this come up because this is going to show some severe reports. You might say, oh, I actually headed into New Mexico and won that tornado. It's up there. But uh, what you can do is just eh, do what I do. Put your hand up over there for just a moment while you click to a different uh, uh, link on here or move it off to the edge of the page so that you can pull up the forecast info. Now this, uh, the meaty stuff over here on the side is uh, all, all sorts of information. There's uh, upper air analysis. There are skew T charts. There's discussion from uh, the SPC about what they think is going to be happening that day. But up here at the top, observation and mesoanalysis is a really cool presentation that if you click on it, it'll take you to a map of the US. And once again, it's going to start off with an animation by default of, of a radar presentation. So if you kind of disregard that for just a moment and uh, as you're doing your virtual chase, and instead click one of, the, one of the other links, like maybe surface observations. There's a lot of information about what's going on in the atmosphere, what happened on that day, that you can imagine, what if this was happening today? What if I was looking at a forecast that said we would have these temperatures, dew points, wind speeds uh, in place in Arizona? You know, is it transition season? And would I be seeing a trough moving through? And this is from the upper air analysis. There's a lot of detail in here. And if you dig into it and want to learn more, it'll give you this picture of the atmosphere on that day, including things like maybe cape values. So think of those those uh, those uh, maps as forecast information. And now ask yourself, where would I position myself on this day? Would this be a good day to chase a storm if I wanted to be out there? And if so, where would I go? And once you've done that, made your plan after looking at that information, uh, head next. Oh, I forgot about this. Also, you can pull up the skew T, do the same thing. Now, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in just a moment. Um, very detailed chart, very informative. But then you can pull up uh, either satellite or radar. And this is where I like to think of this virtual chase as this is the reality now. This is what's playing out. Start early on in this virtual chase and look at the satellite view. Where are the storms forming? What terrain is getting the most uh, convection early on in the day? And does that agree with what you thought was going to happen? Do you like where you virtually position yourself and do you have time to reposition if you think you're, you kind of started out wrong? Maybe you want to move another 100 miles in another direction. Would you have time to do that and get to the storm you want? And as the anvils flow out in that radar presentation, you're able to, I'm going to go back just a second, you're able to advance your way through it with these little buttons left and right. Just move yourself back and forth slowly, step by step through the day. And as those anvils spread out and kind of hide the bases of the storms, uh, you can switch to instead the radar uh, presentation, get to the business end of the storm, and see underneath the anvils and, and still imagine you're using radar scope, maybe, in this case. And where would you continue to go? And are you on the storms that you want? So by doing this, you could get as deep or as, as surface-based as you want with how much information you want to ingest and plan into your virtual chase. And if it's you know winter season, there's, there's not a bunch of storms going on, this could be a great way to kind of build up that experience, build up that pattern recognition. In your mind, as you fail or succeed at these virtual chases, you're learning a little bit something about how the atmosphere sets itself up and how it responds over the course of the day. And then you can use that in the future when you're actually out there spending money and spending time on a chase. So with that in mind, the next thing that I think is really cool is pattern recognition with CAMS. So uh, CAMS, convection allowing models, <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm looking at the wrong screen. Here we go. Let me go back. Here we go. All right. So CAMs are, uh, I'm going to go back and go forward. Let's try that. There we go. Um, are high resolution forecast models that are that have enough detail in them that they can model uh, theoretically what individual storms might, might uh, initiate and propagate in that environment. So this is, a, this is more recent modeling development, and these have gotten you know, really sophisticated in a lot of ways and, and to the point that they are so specific looking that looking at this model, you might think that this is a radar presentation of what's actually happening, uh, but it's not. It's, a, it's the model's interpretation of what's happening. And because of how specific it looks as a storm enthusiast or as a storm chaser, it's easy to get locked into a thought that now that I've seen this on this, on this convection line model, this is how I'm going to respond. 
Um, I, I love what I'm seeing. I'm gonna head out to this site. I'm gonna wait to catch that storm at uh, two o'clock this afternoon. So that gets us into the, the, the gotcha <coughs> section that I wanna talk about. So, um, you know, we see uh, a slow motion transition to, I'm gonna knock stuff over here as I'm bouncing around trying to make sure that everybody can see this. So if you can look over here, um, one of the things that convection allowing models has, there we go, is uh, the ability to plot what's called an updraft helicity slot. <laughs> and this is, um, the, uh, the, the model is looking at a, a storm that it thinks is gonna happen, and it's looking at the environment that it's ingesting. And if it sees a lot of vorticity coming in there uh, and being ingested by the storm, it'll put this track down um, that uh, if you're, especially if you're chasing on the plains, but if you get these in Arizona too, you might look at that and say, oh, that's gonna be a monster supercell. I'm gonna position myself right there. Hooray, you're celebrating this, this great model run and you can start making plans around it. But you gotta, gotta ease up just a little bit and look at a lot of other things because uh, it, can, it can lead you astray. I've, I've made a run to Montana once, uh, early on in the chase, because I took it all too seriously and uh, sat under some just plain blue kind of puppy sky. So um, you don't want to put too much confidence in a single run of that model. You want to be able to, to look at a lot of, of different ones, maybe compare multiple ones and see what's happening so that you don't get too literal with a single run. The other thing is targeting a specific storm and time. So that model will be very precise in where it places the storm, how it times it, and, um, and you need to, to consider a lot of other things so that you're not wasting a lot of time and energy going after a phantom storm. And um, another gotcha that can, get, that can happen is not comparing what the, the model says is happening um, to actual real life observations. So these high res models, they'll show storms happening, but don't just stop there. Jump into the other things that that model is showing. What does it have to say about surface moisture, moisture, surface temperature, uh, upper winds, and shear, and instability? So what, it, what does the model think is happening in that environment that's causing it to say, okay, a big storm's gonna happen there. Then when that day or time comes, now actually go to real observations from the SPC or the National Weather Service. Look at what temperatures and dew points actually are. Look at what the upper air is doing and compare that to what the model thinks was happening. And if you see, if they're kind of jiving with each other, you, that can raise your confidence that maybe the model is picking up on something that's real. Uh, so those, those are just things to, to consider so that uh, you're making the best possible use of those models. Now some of the other things that are, that are really helpful about them is getting into pattern recognition. So again, we only have so much time that we can get out individually and see this stuff happening. But if we can get into these models and watch what's happening, not only maybe are we trying to forecast for the day, but as we look at different runs of the model, we get a view of what physics are in the atmosphere are leading to for those storms to develop. How are they propagating? What exactly is happening? And this may be something, especially when you're getting started, you may not have a good feel for what storms are going to be doing. But when you look at this, then you can get a, a better sense for um, how the atmosphere actually behaves and be better prepared to react to it when it actually happens. Over and over again, that repetition, it builds up that pattern recognition. Um, now, it also is helpful for seeing what I would call red herrings. So uh, when I started chasing, and I, it still happens to me, as the atmosphere convex during the day, you'll have maybe some early convection or convection in another area that, that draws your eye. You know, you weren't expecting it there, but it's going up. Do I leave the target area I'm in to run after that? Um, and then once you get there, that dies and the area you were in picks up and does something awesome. So um, this isn't perfect, but um, these models can give you an idea that maybe there's some, some early forcing that's happening in the atmosphere that's leading to some early storms, but they're kind of drab and, and they're not really gonna do much. And when you compare it to, to other uh, elements of the atmosphere that can tell you, uh, yeah, that's something I might be ready to see happen, but I don't want to chase after it. I want to wait for the more interesting stuff later. And then another thing is advanced warning. So um, because I don't, I'm not a National Weather Service employee, I don't spend as much time as I'm sure uh, that awesome team does in day-to-day -day looking at all that data. I, I have to kind of apportion my time. So I can use these uh, sometimes as an advanced warning system to me. Um, if I just take a quick look at that convection allowing model, it might pick up on some storms that maybe I wasn't expecting, and maybe they're not real, but it gives me the heads up. This is, this is an opportunity now to take some time 
and actually dig into this. Do I want to research this more and plan a chase around it? So you can use it as that. Don't don't rely on it as as gospel or whatever, but use it as a as a tool to give you that word. So these are the pages. I'm going to set up a. I have a link at the end of this presentation. You can go to. I'm going to populate it later this afternoon, um, where you can get some of these links to these models and some other resources. Uh, but in the meantime, there's there's three main pages I like to use for these cave action line models. There's the College of DuPage. Uh, there's Pivotal Weather and the AZWRF. Now, um, they have these different uh, CAM models, but AZWRF is really cool because uh, it's flavored for Arizona. It's, it's, uh, it seems to be a lot more specific to our environment, our topography, and uh, it produces some convection uh, models that are really useful. Uh, Mike Luthold runs that. He, somebody, somebody mentioned him earlier. He also has a blog that talks about how these models are performing and what he's anticipating to happen. I'll include that link too. That's a really good read. So I want to go through a couple of uh, experiences here with this. And so June 5th, uh, 2019, um, this, is, this is something that happened in Texas. Now, as I was preparing for this, I didn't have Arizona examples early this year to give some good examples, but this Texas situation was pretty close to some things we see out here in the desert. And one of the, the first things I was looking at with this is, is this is the HER, uh, High Res Rapid Refresh. Whoops, let's back that on up. Um, that's being modeled for zero Z, which out in the plains, that would be uh, 7 p.m. And this model is showing uh, 12 different runs of that model. It runs uh, every hour during the day. And so 12 Z, 15, 18, 21, all these different runs are showing a very similar pattern, but with some, some interesting differences. Um, at that time of day, they're showing storms lined up in the, in the east, uh, western panhandle. Um, but over time, you notice this southern portion kind of starts getting a little wimpier and, and moving uh, or not propagating as far to the east. These are like little trends that you can watch for in the model. And then if you see that happening, if that's important to an area you want, thought you wanted to chase, you can go to a surface model or surface information, upper air information, see what's changing in the atmosphere. They might be causing the model to make that change. Another interesting thing too is it's got this little gap right here. You know, what's that all about? As those storms are moving in, is, is, is that a real thing? Is there something in the atmosphere that's leading to that? Now beyond that, you can choose all the different models. So that was just four different time runs of that HER model. But we've got these, these other uh, different models that'll, that will be in that link section. HER, NAM Nest, uh, these HRW models, from, uh, you can get a pivotal weather. And then our Arizona flavored ones um, for the, the Arizona WRF models. And so they're all showing very similar setups, but some of them may be showing a lot weaker uh, convection down south. You know, why is that? You can investigate that more and uh, get an idea of, of if that's real and if that'll influence you to, to really focus more energy up north. And when you go in and to those models and compare what's actually happening with convection to the actual uh, surface situation, you can look at dew points. You can look at Cape, uh, the instability uh, in the atmosphere. And when that little gap was showing up right there, there is a little bit of a drop in dew points right there. Maybe that's what's causing it. It could be some other factors too but that might give you a clue as you compare it. And then you can see in real life, is, are the dew points actually really that low in that area? And would that cause you to avoid that spot? Um, and so then it, as time develops, the other thing that I talked about was, um, oh, or wanted to talk about was being careful where you position yourself and using the model to help you to do that well. So um, this is a 15 Zulu run. So at 15Z, the HER ran, made this run of, of, of its model for that hour, and it sees uh, convection starting at 19Z. So that would be um, in New Mexico, minus six, so that's one o'clock. You know, convection is starting to form on the high terrain out there. And then uh, about an hour later, it's building up. You know, and if you're planning your day, and you're thinking, maybe I want to see that isolated convection. Maybe I want to get a time lapse of that stuff forming on the mountain, and I'd get right up in there, you know, if that's really, I feel pretty confident that terrain is going to fire and I want to see a storm. But uh, the model, you, know, you kind of thumb through it and see, is there something I should be watchful for? And what might happen is as that, uh, those storms fire and gradually start moving to the east, um, there's also some little returns starting to happen a little bit further to the east. So if you're you know, somewhere in here, you might be getting hopscotched by some outflow that's pushing up some new storms 
further to the east. It's giving you a view that maybe you wouldn't have intuitively known. Uh, but now you're getting some experience, like if I'm out there, I'm going to be watching uh, to be sure that storms aren't getting ahead of me, because if I really want to see the main show later out here, it's not going to be an easy thing just to follow that first line of storms. I might have to race ahead and get in front of some storms that are flow, forming on some outflow. So that's, that's again, building that pattern recognition and being ready to see things as you kind of gain experience through seeing a lot of different runs of that model. And so going back to uh, that uh, development, as it continues to propagate, we see that little gap showing up that we saw earlier between the north and the south uh, convection. Um, but notice uh, just an hour later, it fills in. You know, that little area that was a gap an hour earlier has filled in. So you might uh, look back at your surface conditions and say, well, maybe it picked up on more, in, more uh, juice in the atmosphere, more dew, pressure dew points, and it finally the outflow kicked off those storms and maybe I don't have to fear avoiding that little area. And you can also use that to tell uh, maybe a good, a good idea of speeds. You know, in, in the uh, plains, these little tiny counties, I can kind of rely on to be about maybe 30-ish miles wide, and you can kind of watch over time the model showing that motion and say, oh, the storms are moving about 35 miles an hour, I can keep in front of that if I want to stay in front and get a really cool nighttime lightning shelf cloud, or maybe I want to stay back here and get some sprites later. Um, so it's part of that planning process. So what actually happened? So we see the radar for that day. Uh, storms fired off the high terrain there. And as they moved over uh, to the uh, east, some stuff launched a little bit further ahead of that one and it kind of jumped real quick. But we have that little weak area that's still showing up right there. So that's, the model did pretty good with that. And then we go forward in time and it does. It fills right on in as it continues. So um, it's kind of good to do a little confirmation afterwards, see, see what happened make a comparison, how good did that model do, and, and build that memory in your mind of how that behavior. <coughs> and then um, Alex Schuth provided a time lapse of that event. This was from uh, near Lubbock, and uh, just really cool to see something like this happen in Texas. <coughs> wow. <Huh. laughs> yeah. Definitely worth our head. That's that's just extremely cool. Um, so Texas gets to the boobs too. Um, so July second, this was something that uh, I got advance warning. This was an advance warning situation I got from the cams. They, uh, I usually don't look for stuff in the morning. It does happen. Um, but as I was just doing a quick check of the herd, I noticed uh, that it suggested multiple runs were suggesting a line of storms are going to come racing uh, uh, eastward across Arizona. Could be anywhere from you know Gray Mountain down to the Verde Valley or whatever, but I just knew that the models were liking that idea. So I did the terrible thing of setting my alarm for three in the morning. Uh, <laughs> got up and checked uh, radar scope, and sure enough, that line was forming and moving on in. And so that was uh, that was the time to all right, uh, got to get ready, head out, and try a sunrise run. And that's pretty cool if you're a photographer. You know, you get used to shooting things maybe in your afternoon light. Um, and then come through and do an early morning thing. And if, if mornings are not your time like me, uh, this is the time to, to get out and see what, uh, what that light does with your landscape in those scenarios. And so that storm came through, rushed through Flagstaff. It was really cool. It came right over town, uh, that line of storms, and formed these cool eddies in the shelf as it rushed through, moved on east, and it was moving at a speed that I could kind of cruise along I-40 and just keep up with it and watch as that shelf just sculpted itself nice. across the landscape um, east of Flagstaff. So that was a good heads up from the from the convection allowing model. Back up, this is November 3rd, 2016. Um, <clears throat> so some of these helicity tracks, those updraft helicity tracks I talked about, we don't get the storms that are that strong very often in Arizona to where they're pulling in strong vorticity. Uh, so when I see a signal like that, um, it, it raises flags. Okay, I want to investigate this because this is a transition season maybe thing uh, that, that I want to look at. Or maybe, you know, maybe it's just uh, an inverted trough moving through. I don't know, there's some sort of shear in the atmosphere I want to investigate what's causing this. I, I did this graphic myself. You're not going to find this on, on SPC. So I, I just took a bunch of the helicity track that I was just so impressed by how consistent it was. And I overlaid it in Photoshop just to kind of get an idea of how consistent it was showing those. So, uh, having a little bit of location bias, I was interested in the northern Arizona uh, target being out of Flagstaff. Um, and so after that, investigated the setup, got ready, and then also looked at those models for how that convection was going to develop during the day. If I saw the clouds uh, or the, the uh, convection building 
in a certain way that led to that strong storm moving through? Um, you know, how did it start a, you know, a few hours earlier? What can I watch for that would give me a heads up that it is behaving the way that I hope it will? And so uh, headed out and got myself uh, an opportunity to see the, my first uh, uh, tornado warned Arizona storm. See those pop up on radar scope and wonder what the heck do those look like? Because they're always out in the middle of nowhere and uh, finally had a chance to see this, this beautiful uh, supercell moving up. Now somebody talked about scouting your locations for the perfect foreground, and wow, did I not scout this area. <laughs> <laughs> so, shut the tear and then keep shooting. Um, but uh, Jack, I think it was Jack Rabbit wrote out by uh, uh, Winslow or Holbrook. Anyways, as that storm moved through, um, just it, it produced some incredible wow. uh, structure that uh, we don't often get to see here in Arizona, um, and uh, got the heads up again from those convection line models to, to dig in for deeper. So, skew T log P. I mentioned I was going to talk about this, and I've got some more, a couple more stories, photo stories to go along with this too, because this is kind of technical stuff. But I think it's important to know because as we're building that pattern recognition about how convection is behaving in the atmosphere, um, that we want to back it up with um, some deeper knowledge about what the atmospheric information um, that I think is just an impressive uh, tool, very impressive tool. But at first uh, look, it's also very scary. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what goes into it. So uh, the Belmont office up by Flagstaff uh, for the National Weather Service uh, let me come by and take some photographs of one of these sounding launches. These skew T's, uh, skew T plots are made to measure the uh, uh, different, uh, different details about the atmosphere through from the surface all the way up to the high levels. And it uses uh, this device, a radioson that uh, has, uh, that's, that, uh, uh, broadcasts position and data about the atmosphere as it rises through the air. So they, they unpack it from its, uh, from its packaging and give it a baseline, make sure it's reading everything correctly to begin with, and then it uh, gets brought out to the upper air building where uh, the balloon is built. Now some, uh, some weather offices use helium, uh, Flagstaff uses hydrogen, so no celebratory cigars in the building. Uh, Hindenburg is getting ready to be built there, and so that balloon as it's filling, uh, the, the radio sonde is prepped and tied off and getting ready for launch outside the building with the peaks kind of looming in the background. What a cool place to launch a balloon, I think. Um, and then once it's ready to go, this, it, this uh, piece up on top of the building here, this is the, uh, the dome that houses the, uh, the radio uh, dish that receives the data from that uh, radio sonde as it's rising through the air. And then off it goes. Thanks to Megan Taylor for, for giving me the opportunity to come out there and watch that thing go. And uh, for the next hour or so, it rises through 100,000 feet of the air and sends back data about uh, temperature, dew point, air pressure, and then the GPS location that helps to show what the wind speed and wind direction is. So all that data comes in, and you can go back into the office. And this is so cool, you know, going in and watching the data come in from that balloon launch live. You know, I'm so used to seeing these uh, after they've been posted, but to see that information coming in is is, uh, is really cool. And so. Um, then that data gets used to ingest into forecast models and by forecasters themselves uh, to determine uh, what's going to be happening in the, in the atmosphere. So what is, how, what is contained in these charts? So if I, if I start off very simply and build it just as like a, a standard, standard grid, you're comparing pressure in the atmosphere vertically with temperature in the atmosphere. And as that balloon rises, it takes those measurements of temperature, a lot of times you'll see that plotted in red, and then the dew point, a lot of times is plotted in green. And so as that balloon rises through the atmosphere, that temperature cools off very quickly. The dew point dries off, uh, dries off very quickly um, along with the temperature as it rises. But it's not a perfect curve. There's jigs and jags in it. It gets a little bit warmer, a little bit cooler at different levels. The air gets a little bit drier or more moist at different levels. And that's what it's doing is it's measuring those values. So why is it structured the way that it is? Um, so it doesn't look quite the same as this. Well, over here, let's go back. Over here on the right, you'll see these uh, approximate altitudes. And uh, that's the, you can roughly correlate the air pressure to the altitude that you're going up. That changes from season to season, but um, you'll notice they're kind of bunched up there at the top, and that's just because the air uh, in the atmosphere uh, thins out much more quickly, starting at the surface, and then it goes more gradually the further up you go. So 
if we kind of mash these uh, lines down a little bit, uh, we get a, what's called a logarithmic scale. That means it's, it's tight, more tightly spaced at the bottom and then gradually more widely spaced at the top. So this gives a more uh, natural spatial representation of the atmosphere. The, uh, the altitudes are more evened out and so you can really see how quickly uh, the pressure drops off as you go up. So that's part of the log peak, logarithm of pressure for the name in that chart when you see that. Now the skew T part comes from nudging those temperatures uh, to the right. Now why would we want to put our temperature grid at a weird angle like this? Well what happens is it raises this temperature and dew point profile closer to vertical. And what that does is it allows us to see subtle changes in the slope of that line. Uh, whereas when it was totally sloped over like this, it was harder to notice those. But now that it's at this angle, we can get a, a quicker read on how fast that temperature is cooling with height. And that's called a lapse rate. You hear people talking about that. How does that temperature change with height? So the next thing you'll see plotted on these charts is something called a dry adiabat. A series of lines occurs to the upper left. And what those are is a measure of uh, if you took this surface parcel of air, I think somebody talked about parcels earlier, might, Emily, that might have been you, um, that when, if that's put on, let's say, you take that on a Looney Tunes crazy elevator ride up through the sky, as it rises up through lower and lower pressure, um, it cools off. And these lines show uh, to what degree it will cool off. That's dry air at the surface being lifted up. It cools off very quickly. In fact, if you took the surface parcel on this particular skew T, plot and lifted it up at a certain point, um, it's going to become colder than the surrounding air. And that means it's going to be denser and heavier. It's going to want to sink if it was dry at that point. But there's another set of lines that we have to add in here. I'm going to show you why these are, these are important. So there's another one called saturation adiabats. These are a measure of what happens if you've got saturated air and you lift it up through the atmosphere. You've got, say, a crazy scenario where it was just 100% foggy at the surface and you lifted that air up through the atmosphere, it would get colder too as it goes up, but it wouldn't get as cold as quickly. Uh, it cools off much more slowly. There's a lot of heat that's, that's being released and, and uh, that water vapor helps it to hold on to it. And that's important to storm formation because it allows that air to stay warmer longer. And you'll notice now that as it has risen up, it's staying warmer than that profile. But you're not gonna raise that from the direct surface. That's, that would be an insane scenario. This plot would not, you wouldn't actually raise moist air directly from the surface in this situation. So what we have, and I'm not gonna go into detail on this, there's some other lines, some dashed lines you see in there, they call them saturation mixing ratio, and that's a, a measure of how much a mass of, of moisture is, or water vapor is contained in some air. But that allows uh, the computer or a meteorologist uh, to calculate raising that dew point along those lines until it meets raising the temperature along those lines, uh, along the dry adiabat lines, up to a certain point where they meet. That's where moisture in that column of air, where the moisture is going to condense. Right at that point, um, then you'll get condensation. That air that was previously clear turns into a cloud. You get a cloud base at that point. So you don't need to remember all the details of why or how that works, but just know that, that when you see those details on the chart, that's what's being calculated, um, is that the air starts out at the surface, cools off very rapidly while it's not been condensed, and then at that point where it meets this um, saturation mixing ratio line to the dew point, it, it turns into a cloud. You've got 100% humidity at that point. You've got per uh, saturated air, and you've got a cloud base. So your cloud bases, you'll see people talking about LCL. That's the lifted condensation level. That's where that gets raised up, that, that air from the surface condenses, you get a cloud base at that level, and that's plotted on the SKU-T. You can tell how high your cloud bases are gonna get um, if they're lifted up by a front or by a mountain range. Then the next thing, as that air is rising up, if it's warmer than the surrounding air, it'll wanna continue rising and it's happy to be buoyant. It's lighter, it's warmer, it wants to rise up through that, that surrounding air mass. But at a certain point, it crosses uh, that temperature profile. Suddenly it gets colder than the surrounding air. And when it gets colder, it gets heavier. It doesn't want to continue rising. It wants to sink back down. That's your equilibrium level, and that's where your anvils are. That, that rising column of air is hitting the top, top of the troposphere and spreading out, because it doesn't want to keep going up, because that upper air is now warmer than it is. 
Now I just tweaked this chart just a little bit to kind of nudge this temperature out to demonstrate something. If we get a little tiny warm layer of air in here, uh, that's called a cap. And if your if uh, parcel of air gets lifted up through that, tried to lift it up through that cap, that means it's at that point it's actually colder than the surrounding air. And if it's colder, it's not going to want to rise through it. You're going to have to force it on through there. And that, when you're talking about a cap, storms will, may struggle to form if there's a significant cap of air and you just kind of get some cumulus that don't really go anywhere else. They need some help to get above that warmer layer of air. But once they do get above it, if you are able to use a front or a mountain range or, or colliding uh, gust fronts to lift it up, you get the LFC. This level is above that cap, and now, as long as that air is free to rise after that point, that's your level of free convection. And that's, that's uh, an important place in calculating what we call CAPE. Now this is, this is where, as a chaser or as a storm enthusiast, you want to look at that value. That, the, the larger that area is between your parcel of air above that LFC, between that parcel of air and the temperature of the surrounding environment, the bigger that is, the bigger your cape. The bigger your cape, the stronger your storms can be. And so if you look at a, at a sounding and you see that it's listed maybe 1,000 joules per kilogram of cape, maybe you can start to get interested. This might be a, a good day for some storms. And up from there, as that cape value rises, they get stronger and have potential for more uh, stronger storms to happen. But you also have, oops, I'm going to go back here just a sec. The other thing I have, come here. Here we go. So that other tiny area, that really tiny area that that cap is, if you measure that area, that's a measure of convective inhibition. That'll be listed as a negative number, like maybe negative 30, negative 100 joules per kilogram. The, the more negative that number is, the harder that cap is going to be to overcome. So you're going to need some strong uh, elements to help force it through that. And then your wind bars come in. So what these are, they show the direction and speed of your wind. So they are. Uh, the pointy end of that, uh, that icon is the direction the wind is headed, and that little triangle, that represents 50 knots. A full staff represents 10 knots, and a half staff represents 5 knots. Yes? Do so you add those together? So if you see all of them, do you add them together to make 65 knots? Exactly. Yeah, that's it exactly. So you just, whatever combo of, of uh, symbols are on the end of that wind bar, that's what you add up to figure out in knots the speed of that wind and then the direction that's pointing. So this would be 65 knots pointed directly east, um, whereas on the actual sounding here, most of them are pointed uh, north, northeast. But that's, that's the, what those symbols mean. And so why, you know, why are they important? Well, they help to determine how your storm environment is shaped. And so at the low levels where that's being ingested by the storm, you can look at where those winds are coming from. What's that environment like? Is it moist and unstable? Or is it cool and dry? And are your storms going to have a chance to survive? Or are they going to struggle in that environment? A little bit further up, you might look at what could be a steering flow for your storms. Kind of as the storm lofts up, what are the winds like there? And when the storms first pop, those winds can help push it in a certain direction. If you're, looking, if you're in one of the cities near the mountains, if those winds are wafting those storms initially towards you, you might have a better chance of them kind of hopping off the mountains in your direction and then forming some gust fronts and, and outflow boundaries and boobs and all that great stuff. But um, they only apply if they're kind of low speed and, and just initially nudging your storms. Once storms get going and dropping rain and colliding outflow boundaries, then that starts driving where those storms are going more so than those steering winds. But they can give that initial push and something to watch for. Uh, the other thing, too, is at the anvil level. So right up here, just where that anvil is going to form at that equilibrium level, um, where is that anvil headed? Is it headed towards where your storms are going? And if so, it might cool off that environment, make it harder for your storms to sustain themselves. But if it's blowing away and your environment is not contaminated by shadowing from those anvils, uh, then that, that can spell a better scenario for your storms to survive. So that gets all put together into this, into this chart. There's a lot of detail in here. It's something that's a learning opportunity. Somebody mentioned MetEd as, as a, a learning tool. Head over there and, and learn more if you want, if you really want to dig into this. But if you just want to keep an eye on a couple of key details, take a look at this CAPE area, this column for CAPE. That'll list uh, the calculation for what's in that area of CAPE. Um, you can look at mixed layer CAPE as maybe a good average of what 
uh, the, the instability in the atmosphere is like. How big is that number and is it getting better? And the other thing is convective inhibition is in there. So you can look at what, how strong your cap is. Maybe it's nothing. The other thing is decay. So this is downdraft cape, and in the desert, we want to pay attention to this because the bigger that number is, that represents evaporation happening underneath the storm as the precipitation is falling down. If it's a warm, dry environment under the storm, that precipitation will evaporate quickly, it'll get cold, and it'll be heavier and accelerate quicker. That's where you get your damaging winds and maybe even forming some, some huge dust storms. The larger that number is, that increases that chance. And then you can look at shear. The more shear you have in the atmosphere, surface to six kilometer shear is, uh, that might give you stronger storms. The greater your shear is, the stronger your storms can be because it separates your updrafts from your downdrafts. And you know, if you click on forecast sounding in your models, you can click on a map and it will bring up what a forecast, maybe a model or sounding would look like. Um, just be careful that if you click one that has some, some little red bars here, this is just something really crazy to look out for, but if you click in the middle of what that sounding thinks is a storm, it'll give you crazy wind fields and will make you think the situation is more severe than it really is. So just watch out. If you see those little uh, red bars over there, that just means really strong uh, updraft winds that are being projected, and that's an indication you've got what's called a contaminated sounding. Click somewhere else until you don't see uh, that kind of jagginess happening over there. So a couple stories then, and we'll wrap it up. So August 18th, 2018, um, we had uh, winds that were uh, a little bit of shear, maybe about 26 knots of shear in the atmosphere, and some forecast surface cape about 2,000 joules per kilogram. I mean, it was it was a it was a decent setup for some good storms. Headed out for those, and um, this is this is something that John Hens was showing. We had some beautiful storms. I was looking for colliding outflow boundaries because sometimes really cool things can happen along those. As outflow collides, sometimes for just a few minutes, they'll shove a new updraft up that gets really cool structure on it. And this was doing some really interesting things, and I was wishing I was out on Lake Mary Road watching this instead of sitting out by Twin Arrows uh, many miles away. But uh, at the same time, another storm had popped up and was ingesting some, some really nice vorticity along a boundary, apparently. And as I was sitting there time-lapsing this storm and looking at these colliding outflow boundaries, John Serlin, who happened to be about a mile down the road, uh, messaged me and said, did you get it? <laughs> and there's a sinking feeling when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank goodness, you know, going back and reviewing footage, you can see, oh, there was something happening there. And, and uh, an animation of this showed uh, several minutes that this little noodle right here was uh, flowing along with this, this storm as it was rotating as this was happening. And that uh, turned out to be a land spout. And when John Hens is talking about reporting these things, um, I get a little bit pedantic about this stuff. And, and so I look at uh, surf, you know, terrain features and where stuff was at and uh, plotted it out and submitted that to the Flagstaff office, um, along with what John had also submitted on, uh, on social media to them. And uh, they went ahead and plotted that as a, as a land spout tornado. Um, another day, 25th, so I was inspired by that. I was like, OK, I'm going to get out here more, look for these land spouts. Um, went out on a day with southwest flow over the Mogollon Rim Convergence Zone. This is where the Mogollon Rim, uh, northeast of that, it dips down into the Little Colorado River Valley. And on days when there's southeast winds, it can create cool convergence boundaries that lift up vorticity and create cool structure and also opportunities for land spouts. And along the way, I caught what I thought, well, there's a little nib coming out of this cloud. And it looks like there's a dust column under it. But I'm way too far away, way out of position. Got some telephoto shots of it. But it's, this is one of those situations where it's so uh, hazy and blurry and terrible shots um, that there might be <laughs> 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 that, that proved Sasquatch that day. <laughs> but it, it, it inspired me. On September 1st, uh, John uh, covered this also too. Great, really awesome day. Looked at uh, soundings in the couple days leading up to it that were very strong instabilities. Good amount of shear for Arizona. And then the morning of, things were looking really good with a lot of cape available, a lot of good shear moving through. Um, we headed up onto the Navajo Reservation. I didn't plan this ahead, but I passed as Murano on the way out there and <laughs> realized, well, if he's on this storm, this setup, then it's probably good. Um, hung out waiting for stuff to come off the peaks. Um, and meanwhile, had forgotten about this outflow boundary that had formed earlier in the morning. And uh, it had laid down this boundary that storms fired behind me to my east. And I had to race to catch up. Um, but when you see uh, this, this kind of structure out here, 
You've got this barrel kind of uh, uh, elliptical structure to the storm updraft. You've got inflow bands leading into it. This was quickly developing into a supercell. Uh, it had lots of, of instability and available shear. And uh, about as I got even to it, the, uh, the, the Flagstaff office warned it for a tornado warning. And, uh, you know, kind of looking through here, there's this really cool wall cloud rotating very quickly. But from my angle at that point, sunlight and dust flowing into it was very difficult to see. So I just was taking shots and video and hoping it caught anything interesting. In fact, this little, uh, this little guy come out of the wall cloud at one point and in, uh, added my contrast oh, there. And I was like, well, maybe, just maybe, that could be something. Um, <laughs> Again, it's, 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 it was a really bad perspective. So uh, that's okay. It didn't, I, I couldn't be certain that was a tornado, but the storm itself was awesome, with RFD just, just carving out excellent shapes in it as it moved along the reservation. And so I think keep, I had to keep an eye on was that it was not the only storm in that line. It was the, the one I was on, but behind it there was two other uh, circulation or two other rotating storms that I needed to watch. But in this situation, what I found, you know, through time and kind of getting that perspective or that pattern recognition is that a lot of times this front storm, if they're, if they're all moving to the right, to the east in that line, that front storm's gonna lay down a lot of, of outflow, cold outflow that's probably gonna choke those storms off. So I was like, okay, I see them, but I'm not gonna worry too much about them. They're probably gonna die off. Except that the one on the end didn't. It somehow managed to jump down and grab onto the good air to the south. And, uh, and then it also became rather awesome so as it turned around, there it was developing this really cool lowering. I would think of those as like cattle catchers on the front of a train. Um, meanwhile, the other storm I was watching is starting to get into some less, less unstable air, and it's kind of withering away, but it's still looking fantastic. What an awesome structure to see um, over our landscapes. Now, meanwhile, storm behind, we're going back and forth, um, and that's where the four cameras thing comes in. Um, this one was now... Uh, developing a really cool lowering on it, kind of trying to imitate the landscape with maybe that little nub of a wall cloud. Um, and as it developed, it got fantastic. A terrace updraft that was just beautiful to see with nomadis forming up above. Um, and this is Arizona, you guys. So um, let's just go through, let's watch it, let's watch it happen. Uh. I don't have any musical this. <laughs> Check out that precipitation falling and kind of getting sucked back into from the inflow into the storm. This is on YouTube also in case it's so tough over on the site. Um, just going and going and going. This wasn't transient, it was just pretty stout and solid. Wow, that's awesome. So maybe the light in there too. And then as it moved off, I raced it off to the east. I wanted to get down south, down to I-40. We're up on the res. I wanted to get up, out ahead of these things as they're moving along. But behind it, uh, a new line of storms had formed. This was a big cluster that built up like a lot of hail. I see that too. I'm close. Um, <laughs> You're okay. <laughs> and as it's moving down, I've got to race this to the south, get to I-40, and then get ahead of it before it, it, it destroys my wife's car. <laughs> <laughs> Because she had a good car at that time, I was really liking using it. Um, and as I'm moving south, this is a this is a kind of really tense situation. Heading south on this road, seeing this growing hail uh, signature, uh, this m mighty mighty storm moving in on your on your location. And you've got to get down to the highway and then jog a little bit to the west before you can head back south on Highway 180. Um, as I finally got to I-40, I had a decision: head east or west. Do I escape to the east, or can I get ahead of this thing to the west in time? And just had a few minutes as baseballs were getting ready to hit the Hopi Travel Plaza. So um, wound my way around it, got back to the south, and here it is. Just an impressive radar signature for an Arizona uh, storm. Looks like a, a Boeing segment to me. I think I've got the terminology right on that. Um, and there it is. The sunset is now starting to set behind this awesome storm um, with baseballs falling in this big old deep dark area with a shelf leading out in front of it. So pretty powerful, scary thing to be uh, to actually see out there, but still also magnificently beautiful. And uh, in the spirit of taking the exact same lightning photo as somebody else, <laughs> <laughs> we can put ours together, make a stereogram, see it in 3D. Um, uh, oops, wrong direction. Let's go back through. And then finally, October 21st, on this set of southwest flow boundary, possibly setting up out on the Muggy and Run convergence zone. 
Uh, I'm really interested in that southwest flow these days, especially hearing what John uh, Hens and John Serlin catching uh, all of those awesome land spouts. Um, uh, but as I saw storms firing, I was kind of dawdling around in town thinking they were going to fire later. They fired earlier than I thought, but radar shows this boundary right here, uh, and that forms uh, on those southwest flow days, and that, that produces vorticity for these storms to ingest. And as I watched this storm, as I was racing out to try and get back to it, because I was kind of out of position, um, it was way north of the boundary, and I thought, well, it's too far north to actually ingest vorticity. But it actually, somehow, it was like, in, like, pulling that boundary in. You can kind of see a little bit of the line here, and somehow it had managed to latch into that. So here's uh, here's my view as I'm heading out, trying to get on it, just figuring I might look for some good structure uh, that'll be kind of just a fun, light little chase. But look what's up here. Somebody caught my eye. connected at this point. You've got a funnel, you've got a dust column, but there's nothing in between. lead up to finding your parking spot on something that might only last seconds, FYI. <laughs> So that's how it turns out. These things are so quick. You see a picture and it feels like it's lasting forever, but uh, they're very transient, quick events. And so that was, uh, that was kind of the, the inspiration for me. I, I want to see more of that. <coughs> And, and then the light on it, you know, when the sun is pouring down on it, it just is, is brilliant. All that dirt getting pour, pulled up into that uh, vortex. But then the light comes up and you get this chocolate brown situation going on. And uh, and just kind of a quick time lapse of it in motion. Check out that downward motion in the outer sheath of dust that's, that's wrapping around the vortex. Uh, it's just such a complex and interesting interaction. And I hid the part on here, I, I didn't show the full video where I was calling it into the National Weather Service and, and I posted it on YouTube and got a comment from somebody saying, yeah, I flinched when he called that in as a land spout tornado, uh, you know, because uh, a lot of people kind of disdain the idea of, of a land spout being a tornado, but it is, you know, so call it in, they get to make the decision on whether to plot it or not. Um, and then follow the storm on up into the, the painted desert and then home for some sunset uh, convection. And that's a great way to, to end a chase here in Arizona is with our clear, beautiful sunset skies on these storms. And that wraps up what I wanted to show you. Thank you very much.